Our speaker today is a friend of our college, and we are proud of that fact, proud to know him, uh, proud to benefit from knowing him, which we do greatly. Uh, he's an English guy. Um, he's a BA, MA, and PhD in English Theology and Divinity. Uh, he has an honorary degree from Hillsdale College where he gave one of our very best commencement speeches that I've ever heard, in which he proceeded on a career of making fun of and humiliating the name of the college at great length. <laughs> There'll be more of that crap today. Um, he uh, is a learned divine, uh, first a Protestant, now a Catholic. Uh, we all, we're familiar with this phenomenon around here. <laughs> and also, it goes back the other way sometimes. That's a thing you've got to get used to. If you, if you call me up and say, I'm very upset my, my child has changed churches from Protestant to Catholic or the other way, I always say, thank God he didn't take up devil worship. <laughs> so, <laughs> That was my comment when I heard that Professor Ward had changed his uh, affiliation. He's, he's been a deacon in the Church of England and a priest. Ooh. Chaplain of Peterhouse. What else has he done? He teaches at Houston Baptist now uh, until he comes up here. Um, I guess the thing that brought him to my notice and many of our notice early was that he's one of the leading experts on C.S. Lewis. Uh, his book, he's written several now and he's got more coming, but his book called Planet Narnia contains one of those great insights that uh, scholars get once in a while and it's one, they don't get many, nobody gets many in his career. Most don't get any like this. But it was thought of C.S. Lewis that uh, he was not a very careful writer and that uh, his friend Tolkien was much better. And if you judge the, uh, the uh, fiction that they wrote for children and science fiction and fantasy, that uh, Tolkien was much better. And of course, there's that story that Tolkien disapproved of Lewis's fiction. So that's sad when you hear things like that. And so Michael Ward comes along to explain to us that these books that we all love are serious books. And that comes to him because he has the eyes to see serious things from the human point of view, which of course always involves both reverence and humor. A great man, Michael Ward. There's a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones together. Thank you, President Arn, for your introduction. Good morning, good day, everybody. Senior class, especially other students, faculty, staff, trustees, honored guests, 50-year alumni, Mr. and Mrs. Babbitt, Mr. Stroik. It's a great delight for me to be back here at Hillsdale to speak at this spring convocation and to mark the groundbreaking for the new chapel, a building which I believe will be not only the jewel in the crown of the Hillsdale estate, but a fine example nationally and indeed internationally of church architecture in an educational setting. On my last visit two years ago when I spoke at commencement, I drew attention to the one serious deficiency of Hillsdale College, and it is the only one I'm aware of, uh, namely the strikingly inadequate attention given here to the life and work of Winston Churchill. <laughs> now, I was joking, of course. I have full faith in your Churchillian credentials, and all the more so now that I see you are building an actual church on a hill. <laughs> Thank you. 
I know it's a chapel on a hill, not a church on a hill, but Church Hill is funny and Chapel Hill is not. <laughs> Begging the pardon of all Tar Hills present. Um, admiring earlier this morning as I was the statue of Churchill in Grewcock and the statue of Margaret Thatcher in the quadrangle, and reflecting on the fact that you've invited this Englishman to give this convocation address, I began to wonder whether Hillsdale had received the right memo from the White House. The aim, remember, is make America great again, not make America Great Britain again. Shortly after convocation is over, we'll go to the site of what will be the new building, Christ Chapel, as it's to be known, and with all due ceremony, various people, I'm told, will pick up a spade and lift a small pile of earth from one place to another. When all that's done, a sliver of dirt, a little gash of brown, will lie freshly exposed to the sky. New ground will have been broken. And so the college will have formally declared the start of its latest and in some ways perhaps its greatest ever enterprise, the building of a chapel to the glory of Christ. This chapel will be built not to the glory of Hillsdale, though it will redound mightily and rightly to the credit and renown of this college, not to the glory of the benefactors, though their generosity and public spiritedness can hardly be saluted with sufficient gratitude. Not to the glory of the students who in future will worship there, graduate there, perform music there. Wonderful, though all those things most certainly are. It will be built to the glory of Christ, who himself glories in our educational endeavors, our philanthropic benefactions, our pupillary activity, for God is no man's debtor. Now, I feel fondly towards this new chapel, and it's not even been built yet. And that's because, two years ago, I was in Houston one Sunday morning, and I went for the very first time in my life to a church called St. Teresa's in a part of Houston called Sugarland. And I went there, I must confess, partly to see what they make churches of in Sugarland. <laughs> Candy? Pillars of licorice I was hoping for? Walls of marzipan? Roofs of chocolate? Would Willy Wonka give the sermon? Would a jelly baby be baptized? <laughs> Would we have communion with bread or gingerbread? The reality was far better than any Hansel and Gretel fantasy I could have entertained. St. Teresa's was beautiful. At any rate, it was beautiful inside. Outside, it was no great shakes. But I asked and discovered that the interior had recently been renovated from top to toe and so impressed was I, after I got home, that I spent a long time browsing the website of the architectural firm who did the job. The more I looked at the work of this architect, whom I'd never heard of before, I'd, I'd never heard of any American architects before, I must confess, the more I was impressed, indeed astonished, by its quality. Here was architecture that lifted the spirits, that assisted you in worship rather than causing you to wonder whether God exists. <laughs> We've all been in those churches, I'm sure. <laughs> Here was an architect who evidently knew and respected the history and the traditions of architecture and who was bringing the timeless principles of that art form to new life in the modern day. Not long afterwards, I was in California, and I took a deliberate three-day detour to see another commission by this same architect, the chapel at Thomas Aquinas College. This was his work both inside and out, and this was stunning, miraculous, that such a work could be put up in the modern day. So when, in May of that year, 2015, I came to Hillsdale to give the commencement address, and Dr. David Whalen told me of the plans to build a new chapel here, I said to him almost dreamily, you are going to get Duncan Strike to design it, aren't you? And he said, yes, we are. <laughs> what are the chances of that? 
At Oxford, we are trained to make a little knowledge go a long way. And here, the one single fact I knew about American architects went straight in the bullseye. <laughs> As if I knew all about American architecture. <laughs> so I'm very fond of this chapel. I think it's got a great future ahead of it. It's also got a great past behind it. Hillsdale College, as you well know, was founded in the first half of the 19th century at 16 minutes to 7. I mean, 1844, sorry. Um, <laughs> Article 6 of the college constitution states, religious culture in particular shall be conserved by the college and by the selection of instructors and other practicable expedients it shall be a conspicuous aim to teach by precept and example the essentials of the Christian faith and religion. Those practicable expedients are now being understood with a whole new level of seriousness and holy ambition. 173 years after its founding, Hillsdale formally begins today what I understand will be a two-year process of building a suitably sized suitably special, suitably sacred space, thus helping to fulfill that original aim of the founders. 173 years. Good things come to those who wait. Sometimes you just have to be patient. There are flowers, cacti, I'm told, that bloom only once every couple of centuries. I was taken to see one once in the Botanic Gardens in Oxford. Amazing thing. Though the the smell was awful. It smells like rotting flesh. But that's by the way. I know that we're told that Americans and Brits have different perspectives, that in America a hundred years is a long time, while in Britain a hundred miles is a long way. <laughs> well, that's not always true. I've traveled nearly 4,000 miles to be with you today, and that's actually not a very long distance to be among friends in sunny Hillsdale. And Hillsdale itself, as I know very well, has a rooted historical sense. You're fully aware that 173 years is no great delay in the grand scheme of things. Indeed, it could be regarded as rather hasty. I used to be chaplain of Peterhouse, the oldest college in Cambridge, which, though founded in 1284, didn't get round to building its own dedicated chapel till 1628. That's nearly half past four. I mean, that's 344 years. 173 is almost exactly half that. So really, what you're doing today is terribly hasty. You should slow down. <laughs> Incidentally, that chapel at Peterhouse was built under the presidency of Matthew Wren, who was uncle of none other than Christopher Wren, builder of St. Paul's Cathedral. President Arne mentioned that his daughter, Alice, has studied at Notre Dame under Duncan Stroik. Well, if Mr. Stroik is not already America's Christopher Wren, let's hope Miss Alice Arne one day will take that laurel herself. This building, this church, College Baptist Church, has served Hillsdale well for most of those 173 years, but now the time is ripe for the full flowering to move from the good to the best, to the college's own purpose-built, suitably sized chapel. The quadrangle will be completed. That providentially preserved gap between Grucock and the Dow Center will be filled up and a permanent place of worship, place of ceremony, place of beauty and dignity will emerge. Religious culture shall, more hospitably than ever before, be conserved by the college. The founder's aim is fructifying. But though we're breaking new ground today, there's no absolute novelty occurring. It's not mere change that's happening, but a synthesis of change and continuity. The nature of the college is being more fully realized, becoming more itself, finding a more developed way in which to teach by precept and example the essentials of the Christian religion. Religion tends to get a bad rap these days, and from two directions. On the one hand, we hear people say that they are spiritual but not religious. They may be interested in Christianity, but certainly not religiosity. Religion here means 
something like ritualism, mere formalism, the externals of faith. On the other hand, some people take religion to mean folly or superstition or even fanaticism. As when Richard Dawkins says that religion flies planes into buildings but science flies rockets to the moon. Surely one of the most fatuous things ever said by an Oxford professor. And I've heard a lot of fatuous things in Oxford. I've even said a few of them myself. <laughs> Why do I think that's so fatuous? Well, firstly, because religion and science, being abstract nouns, not people, don't actually do anything, good or bad. They are not agents. And secondly, because if we're going to play that game of ascribing agency to abstract nouns, one might just as well say religion gives us Mother Teresa while science gives us mustard gas. It's much better simply to say that there can be bad religion and good religion. There can be bad religion done well. There can be good religion done badly. There can be mediocre religion done well or badly, just as is the case with science. So for many years, I've been on a mission to reclaim the word religion from this verbicide that it's been suffering. Religion doesn't mean either formalism or fanaticism. Etymologically, it means rather something like tying back together, religion, religamenting, religaturing, finding the, the unifying reality behind disparate appearances, seeking oneness, integration, wholeness, a, a theory of everything, as Stephen Hawking might say. Religion, in this sense, is the opposite of analysis. Analysis from the Greek analusis means loosening up, not tying back together, but loosening up. There is a, obviously, of course, naturally, a place for analysis. We do often need to pull things apart, to dissect them. But analysis serves synthesis, doesn't it? It's not an end in itself. You disassemble the engine of your car when it's malfunctioning in order to find out the problem and then put it back together so that it's in working order again. It wouldn't run more smoothly if you just left it in pieces on the garage floor. You cut open the human body to remove the tumor or the bullet or whatever it may be. Then you sew up the incision religiously to bring back health to the organism, health that depends upon integration, health that won't survive perpetual loosening up. You break new ground for a similar reason. You dig up a whole load of earth and rocks and roots. You loosen it and scatter it about, removing some bits, relocating other bits. And not only physically with the earth, but intellectually with architectural principles. You analyze, you loosen up what makes for a good building. You analyze what makes for a good building in this particular place. You analyze what makes for a good building in this particular place for this particular body of people. And all this analysis takes years. There's mess and noise and expense and disagreements. And people look at you like you're crazy. The interruptions to normal life go on for years. All sorts of unexpected problems crop up along the way. And this is when it's going well. But strength rejoices in the challenge. And the true crop is not these disturbances, these echoes of primordial chaos when the earth was formless and void. Rather, the true harvest of all these efforts will be a noble building, a thing of beauty and a joy forever, in which Hillsdalians shall flourish, both individually and corporately, and from which the God who's given us everything in Christ can be given back the best we have to offer, which is all too little, but in which offering we transcend ourselves and therefore most truly find ourselves. So analysis, I maintain, is not an end in itself, but is religion an end in itself? Isn't it possible to be too religious, to be so interested in unity and oneness that you never look for change? Can't the religious impulse devolve into a kind of frigidity or frozenness, a paralysis in which the way we've always done things must be the way we always do things, forever and ever, amen? 
Well, that is a danger, yes. Obscurantism, the Luddite impulse, tying things back together so tight that life becomes one big strangulating corset. That is a danger. True religion, however, should always be corrigible, both self-critical and open to correction from without, open to revision in the light of new knowledge in response to new situations, not cramping in upon itself or always ratcheting up the interior tension, but periodically relaxing, taking stock, surveying new horizons, like the heart that now contracts, now expands. In the history of Christianity, St. Peter and St. Paul are the great archetypes we do well to have in mind when we think like this. St. Peter is the rock. That's what the name Peter means. You don't have to be a Catholic to accept that Peter was the first bishop of Rome. And the defining function of any bishop is to sit rock-like, stationary in a chair, a cathedra, to be a focus of unity for the flock which he regulates with his shepherd's crook. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The Petrine principle provides for fixity, certainty, a still point in a turning world. But St. Paul is the missionary, the apostle to the Gentiles, who goes all over the Mediterranean, spreading the word, founding new churches, tackling practical problems, developing new theological understandings, firing off letters left, right, and center, and once even challenging Peter to his face. And this Pauline principle is important because I recognize that not everyone at Hillsdale calls themselves Christian. You may not be much interested in the life of the new chapel when it comes. You have other fish to fry. You may even wish, respectfully, to challenge this or that aspect of Hillsdale's priorities. That's a good role to fulfill in a community. Every human organization needs Pauls as well as Peters, Paulers as well as Petras. If it was all about Peter, things would petrify. If it was all about Paul, things would be appalling. <laughs> you need both. You need both. You need the rock in Rome and the one who roams and rocks. <laughs> Two principles, in tension with each other, respecting each other, but both seeking one ultimate goal, serving the same beating heart. The heart itself is more important than whether the blood within it happens to be ebbing or flowing. True religion, therefore, needs to be understood in two senses. It both does and is. There's the particular religious impulse, the function, the tying back together. But then there's religion itself, the overall pattern, the continual, rhythmic, regular process of now tying back, now loosening up. Neither Peter nor Paul was an end in himself. Each was a servant of Christ. The two pointed to the one, the unity beyond themselves. And that greater unity, that final or ultimate re-ligamenting is why it's so fitting that this new chapel will be known as Christ Chapel. For Christ is the one in whom all things hold together. Both the tightening and the loosening both the systolic and the diastolic, both the rock and the rocking. Today, we break new ground. We challenge the rock, so to speak. We do something very Pauline, very analytical, scattering earth this way and that. But we do so with an aim in mind, to develop and extend that ground into a new unity, an enlarged oneness, we have a Petrine end in view. There is a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones together. May earth be better and heaven be richer for the life and labor of Hillsdale College. Amen. <laughs>